tonight. Losing hope. Taiwan picks up the pieces following the deadliest quakes in decades. The aftermath leaves hundreds still stranded and struggling to survive. More accusations. The global condemnation of Israel's supposedly mistaken strike continues as concerns arise on the true intent of the operation. Full steam ahead. The road to the White House sees Republicans pulling ahead while Donald Trump trumps Biden in the latest polls. And it's Sakura season. Japan's cherry blossom begins to bloom with full force leaving a serendipitous scenery. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News this Thursday evening. We have a lot to get you updated on tonight, starting off with the updates over in Taiwan. Well, at least nine people are dead and over a thousand have been injured after a magnitude 7.4 earthquake struck Taiwan. Search and rescue operations are ongoing for 143 people trapped or stranded in mines and tunnels. The magnitude 7.4 earthquake that rocked Taiwan on Wednesday has resulted in at least nine deaths and injuries to over a thousand people. As of 10 p.m. Wednesday local time, 231 buildings across the island state were reported to have been damaged. Also, 143 people were left trapped or stranded in mines and tunnels, with overnight search and rescue operations being conducted. Three of the deaths and injuries to about 40 people were caused by falling rocks caused by a landslide at the Taroko National Park, a famous local tourist attraction. 50 workers traveling in minibuses to a hotel in a national park are also missing. Aftershocks have slowed the search and rescue operations, with over 200 being reported since the initial quake. Two of the aftershocks were reported to have been greater than magnitude 6. The first 72 hours are considered the golden time for rescue operations, with the death toll expected to rise even further after that. Today being the first day of the Qingming holiday in Taiwan, where people visit their ancestors and pay their respects at their graves, the damage caused by Wednesday's earthquake is causing traffic disruptions as roads and railways are restricted in many areas. The Taiwanese government has prepared measures, including alternatives by plane and by sea, to help ease the delays. The latest earthquake is the largest since the 1999 quake, which killed over 2,400 people. Now we move on to the Israel-Palestine conflict, specifically on the unfortunate loss of aid workers due to an apparently misdirected strike by Israel. Celebrity chef Jose Andres say Israel targeted his aid workers systematically car by car, adding that the Israel Defense Forces was aware of the convoy's whereabouts. They were targeted systematically car by car. Celebrity chef Jose Andres told in an emotional interview on Wednesday that the Israeli airstrike that killed seven of his World Central Kitchen aid workers in Gaza had been deliberately targeted, and he rejected Israeli and U.S. assertions that it was a mistake. Andres said his charity group had clear communication with the Israeli military, which he said was aware of the convoy's whereabouts, and he called for investigations by the U.S. government and the home countries of every aid worker that was killed in the attack. The aid workers were killed when their convoy was hit shortly after they oversaw the unloading of 100 tons of food brought to Gaza by sea. Israeli's military expressed, quote, severe sorrow over the incident, and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called it unintentional. A U.S. official said President Joe Biden, who spoke to Andres on Tuesday, will speak by phone to Netanyahu on Thursday. The White House has described Biden as outraged by the attack, but the president has made no fundamental change in support for Israel in its war in Gaza. Meanwhile, the State Department said the U.S. wants a swift Israeli investigation into the incident, Here's State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller. It doesn't really matter how they made the mistake. At the end of the day, you have seven dead aid workers who are there trying to deliver humanitarian assistance. So whatever the reason was that led to this tragedy, whatever the, the mistake that happened inside the IDF, it's unacceptable. Andres said his organization was still studying the safety situation in Gaza as it considers starting aid deliveries again. He also condemned the war in Gaza as a whole 
noting that at least 196 humanitarian workers have been killed there since October, according to the United Nations. Still on the situation, Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said Israel's explanations for the deaths of seven aid workers in Gaza, including Australian woman Somi Francom, was not good enough as global condemnation continues to pour into Israel. For more on this, we have other in world news special correspondent Binet Severatna from Melbourne in Australia. Binet? Yes, Binet. Israel said it mistakenly killed workers of charity World Central Kitchen during widespread condemnation from the United States and several allies. The dead included citizens of Australia, Britain and Poland, as well as Palestinians and a dual citizen of the US and Canada. Albanese seemed to be referring to comments from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in a video message in which he said that this happens in war, as the Israeli military promised an independent investigation. Albanese said Franklin was travelling in a vehicle clearly identified as an aid vehicle, and it should not have been at risk. He demanded full accountability on a call with Netanyahu. Back to you, Vinod. Thank you, and that was Adha Dirana World News Special Correspondent Binet Seniviratna from Melbourne in Australia. And now more on tensions relating to Israel. Iran is also vowing to retaliate after it accused Israel of bombing its embassy complex in Syria on Monday in a deadly escalation of regional tensions over the war in Gaza that once again appear to raise the risk of a wider Middle Eastern conflict. Iran has accused Israel of carrying out an airstrike on the Iranian embassy in Syria on Monday, which killed five military advisers and two generals and pledged to retaliate. Supreme Leader of Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, said on Wednesday that Israel will be slapped for the attack. Monday's airstrike in Damascus destroyed a consular building adjacent to the main embassy grounds. Israel has not claimed responsibility for the airstrike, although an Israeli government source told that those killed had been responsible for attacks against Israeli and U.S. assets. Iran has so far avoided direct conflict with Israel since the outbreak of war in Gaza, while indirectly supporting forces that attack Israeli and U.S. targets. And over on regional updates, we have somewhat of an unprecedented legal situation. Thailand's constitutional court accepted a case seeking the dissolution of the opposition Move Forward Party in another blow for a popular anti-establishment movement pushing major institutional reforms. Thailand's opposition Move Forward Party suffered a major setback on Wednesday. The country's constitutional court accepted a case filed by the Electoral Commission seeking to disband it over a controversial campaign to reform a law that shields the powerful monarchy from criticism. The law carries a punishment of up to 15 years jail for each perceived insult of the royal family. The palace typically does not comment on the law, which is among the strictest of its kind in the world. Wednesday's ruling is another blow for the popular anti-establishment movement pushing for major institutional reforms, and follows a January ruling by the same court that found Move Forward's plan to amend the law was unconstitutional and tantamount to an attempt to overthrow the system of government with the king as head of state. Move Forward has denied that was its intention. A spokesperson for the party said on Wednesday that it would prepare its defence and was ready for all scenarios. The party pulled off a stunning feat by winning last year's election, but it was blocked from forming a government by lawmakers with the royalist military. Move Forward is the biggest party in the lower house with about 30% of seats. Recent polls show it is still Thailand's most popular party. Its progressive platform resonated among young and urban voters with its reform agenda, which threatened to upend Thailand's conservative status quo. Move for its leader Peter Lim Jeronrat in February told his party would fight tooth and nail for its future. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. We are continuing with regional updates now. Some flight fumbles are occurring in neighboring India. A major Indian airline is scaling back operations this month amid widespread flight cancellations and delays due to unavailability of its pilots. Since 31st March, Vistara has been nearly 150 cancellations and 200 flight delays. 
Media reports said the disruption was caused by pilots going on mass sick leave to protest against changes post the airline's merger with Air India. Vistara says it is looking into better work-life balance for its pilots. A Vistara official said the airline was scaling back its network temporarily and that customers would be given refunds for cancelled flights. Vistara CEO Vinod Kannan apologised to pilots for taxing schedules and sought their support in resolving concerns. Mr Kannan also said that flight cancellations would continue until the end of the month to create a pilot buffer. The Tata Group, which holds a majority stake in Vistara, bought debt-ridden Air India, formerly India's national carrier, from the government for $2.2 billion in 2021. It is now in the process of consolidating its airline business as it merges its various entities. And now updates on the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Russia's defense minister warned his French counterpart against deploying troops to Ukraine in a rare phone call. Sadi Shoigu told French defense minister Sebastien Lecornu that if Paris follows up on its statements about the possibility of sending a French military contingent to Ukraine, it will create problems for France itself. This is according to the statement from the Russian defense ministry. For more on this, we have other than world news special correspondent Simashi Pereira from Moscow in Russia. Simashi? Yes, we know. French President Emmanuel Macron said in February that the possibility of Western troops being sent to Ukraine could not be ruled out. French officials have since clarified that the suggestion concerned using troops for training and the operation away from front lines. The call marked the first such contact between Russia and the French Defense Ministry since October 2022. France has denied Russia's claim of a discussion on potential Ukraine talks. Russia said that Shaigu and Loikur discussed the potential for talks on the Ukraine conflict during the phone call, but it's claimed that Paris immediately denied. Russian drones hit residences early on Thursday in Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city, killing five, including three rescue workers, in a repeated strike. Kharkiv's mayor, Ihor Tegrakova, writing on the Telegram message app, said four people died at the scene of one attack, at least three of them rescue workers killed after they have arrived at the scene and a new strike occurred. Five people were injured. Back to you, Vinod. Thank you. And that was Adad Renewal News Special Correspondent Simanshi Pereira from Moscow in Russia. And on the road to the White House tonight, according to new polling by the Wall Street Journal, former President Donald Trump is leading President Biden in several key swing states. Trump is leading in six battleground states, which is a major reversal from 2020 when Biden won all but one. Wow, what a nice crowd this is. Former President Trump barnstorming the Midwest this week, hoping to flip a critical region for his campaign. November 5th, we are going to win this state, we're going to win the White House, and we are going to save our country. We're going to save our country. Mr. Trump holding events Tuesday in Wisconsin and Michigan, two states he won in 2016, but lost to Joe Biden four years later. The former president now looking for cracks in Democrats' so-called blue wall ahead of their November rematch. Go out and vote. And tonight, new polling shows he may have found some. A new Wall Street Journal survey shows Mr. Trump leading in six battleground states, including several Midwestern prizes. Biden is still within the margin of error in all of them. But it's a major reversal from 2020 when Mr. Biden won all but one of these states. The pair in a dead heat in Wisconsin, where the presumptive GOP nominee taunted Mr. Biden from a rally stage in Green Bay. We have an empty podium right here to my right. You know what that is? That's for Joe Biden. I'm trying to get him to debate. We see a semblance of democracy restored in Turkey tonight. Thousands of people took to the streets in Turkey's southeastern city of Van to celebrate the election board decision restoring pro-Kurdish mayor elect Abdullah Seydan to his post. Thousands celebrated in the streets of the Turkish city of Van on Wednesday after the city's election board restored a pro-Kurdish mayor elect Abdullah Zidan. He was blocked from office by Turkish authorities despite winning local elections on Sunday. Instead, they announced that the runner-up from President Tayyip Erdogan's 8K party, who garnered 27% of the vote, would assume the seat, despite Zidane's 55% majority. 
The decision sparked protests across Van, with demonstrators clashing with police on Wednesday. Speaking at an iftar event in Ankara, President Erdogan accused the protesters of trying to terrorize the streets and said Turkey would not allow terrorism barons to disturb the peace in cities. The ruling was later overturned by the High Election Board after Zidane's appeal, prompting larger crowds to flood the streets once again in celebration. People waved flags of Zidane's DM party, made victory signs and dance as Zidane told the crowd that the people had protected their honor. Boeing continues to see no uplifting times. Boeing 737 MAX jetliner production has fallen sharply in recent weeks as U.S. regulators step up factory checks and workers slow the assembly line outside Seattle to complete outstanding work. Boeing faces a battle to produce its 737 MAX jets amid quality checks and scrutiny by watchdogs. Industry sources say output has plunged following the mid-air blowout on one of the planes in January. The incident sparked fresh concern over how well Boeing's best-selling jet is made. The Federal Aviation Administration has imposed a cap on production as a result. Boeing can only produce 38 per month while it takes steps to address quality issues. However, output appears to be fluctuating well below that level. The sources say it sank to single digits in March. That's a big problem for the plane maker, which only gets paid when jets are delivered. It's also a headache for the thousands of firms which supply it, including engine maker CFM, as it too only gets paid when finished planes are handed over to airlines. Meanwhile, Boeing's arch-rival Airbus continues to churn out aircraft, cementing its market lead. Sources say it is seeing monthly output of around 50 A320neo family jets, which compete with the MAX. However, the European firm faces snags of its own, including a shortage of seats. That has delayed the delivery of some of its planes. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. It's always important to remember once in a while to stop and take a view. Well, Tokyo residents and tourists did just that as they flocked to the park near the Imperial Palace to see the half in bloom cherry trees. Ahead of forecast of approaching rainy weather, which would likely cause the delicate pink flowers to fall, the Japanese capital's cherry blossom season started last Friday, the latest in the last 10 years as a result of low temperatures in March. Cherry blossoms or sakura are usually in full bloom about a week 10 days after the first bloom. The tradition of even sakura typically attracts thrones of people who would go to parks to sit under cherry trees for picnics, singing and drinking. But due to approaching bad weather, many people rush to see the flowers while they can. And finally tonight, we have an intriguing story. We often don't realize that what materials we interact with the present day could one day in the far future be a part of history museums. Well, here we have for you the story of a book that made its way through Milleria and has recognized one of the oldest books in existence. How much would you buy willing to pay for this piece of history? Take a look. One of the oldest books known to mankind, The Crosby Show in Codex, created around 250 to 350 AD, is expected to fetch over 2.6 million US dollars at a Christie's auction in London this June. One of the earliest known texts of two books of the Bible, the first epistle of Peter and the book of Jonah, consists of 104 pages and was written in Coptic on papyrus by one scribe over a period of 40 years at one of the very first Christian monasteries founded by St. Pacomius in Upper Egypt. It was discovered in Egypt in the early 1950s and has had two owners, the University of Mississippi and the Norwegian manuscript collector, Dr. Martin Schoen. Well, that is all we have for you tonight on World News. Join us again tomorrow for more updates from across the globe. Thank you for watching and have a good night.